The day has finally arrived. Long form launches now with Yarek, head of Gen Lambda, developer of the AXO exchange platform. Ready? Let's go! All right, long form finally begins. We've been planning this for like a year. Yarek, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I know it's late in Europe. Are you, you guys must be so busy right now. Are you guys just working like 20 hours a day right now? <laughs> 24, <laughs> we wish the day had more hours. Uh, thank you for bringing me on, actually. I'm really honored. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, the show. Uh, you are a really reasonable voice in the space. And the fact that you are bringing me fast now is just like, uh, please extremely nice. Thank you for that. Oh, man, that's so nice of you to say that. I appreciate you coming on. I can't, again, I can't imagine how busy you guys are right now. Where's everybody at? We've got we've got the comments uh, visible on the side. Uh, Yark and I can mm -hmm. both see them, I believe. Where's everybody at? We usually like to do a little check-in because we generally have a very international audience. New Zealand. Okay, who else? A little bit, this is kind of an odd time. This is kind of an odd time of day to do these. Usually we do them very, very, uh, very much later in the Western Hemisphere. Namibia, Netherlands. I, we have some people from Poland. I've seen uh, Crypto at the Nighttime, Crypto Twitter on Forum. Uh, he's, yep. uh, Poland, London, Heaven, Australia, Germany, Maine, San Jose, Poland. There we go. Scotland, Montreal. Okay, okay, good, good. London again, Moon, uh, Namibia, Canada. Okay. <laughs> we got there. At least some of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a couple different moon entries. Apparently, we have a couple people watching from the moon now. This is great. Okay, California, Indiana, Hawaii, Connecticut. Okay, Texas. Okay, okay. As usual, good international audience. <laughs> Okay, so we'll, we'll get going here. We don't want to waste any of your arcs time, very valuable time. So let's start out from, from the beginning. I like, I, I know in crypto, we get very focused on, I think sometimes almost being too business-like and we never really explore the personalities of the people in our space. So I'm hoping in, in, this, uh, in this podcast, we can talk a little bit, a little bit about some of those things that we never seem to get to in crypto. So starting from the very beginning, what was little Yark like? How would your parents describe little Yark? What kind of things were you interested in? Um, I think the background behind me, like I already tell us half of the story. Uh, I was from extremely early age, really into uh, scientific study. And I know it sounds weird, but like I was like this five-year-old kid asking for the astronomy books and the books with mathematical puzzles actually. I'll actually use a prop, believe it or not. <laughs> this is the book my mom got me. I think I was like six or seven. And it's not an easy book, but I was like, okay, damn, like I cannot solve any of those problems, right? I have to work on solving them. And it really got me much deeper into the math. And uh, yeah, like I, I, I really enjoy learning and understanding the world around me. And I think it's in big part thanks to my mom. She always liked to tell me the stories. And it sometimes got me into the trouble that I think you shouldn't get into. So, you know, like I remember in the kindergarten, uh, the teacher asking us to add single digit numbers, right? But I already knew like the simple trick, you know, like how to uh, multiply and add you new know, numbers to just like put them one behind each other. It's like very easy, right? And like the teachers called me in front of the class, you know, like everybody took the exercise too soon, of course, except Yarek, right? So I was uh, <laughs> in that sense, like uh, tr troublemaker. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it seems like it seems like a lot of people who are who are um, very interested in things that maybe other kids their own age aren't as interested in. They tend to like have that trait. They get into not like really bad trouble always, but a little bit of trouble. They cause a little bit of trouble like that. What was that on the uh, on the cover of that book? Uh, I saw the owl. Did the owl have mm -hmm. something in its eyes? What, what were in the owl's eyes there? 
<laughs> Nothing special. Uh, so it's just like a bit of uh, trigonometry on the sides, but the eyes are pretty normal. Okay, okay. Yeah, I noticed there was something in his eyes. I couldn't tell if that was, uh, if those were constellations. Okay, I see now. Okay, okay. The owl is just kind of winking at us. He's winking at us. Uh, if you want, we can agree that's either a tumbleweed or some galaxy, you know, you, you choose. Okay, either one. The owl, the owl is opening up some secrets, though. It looks like the owl is letting letting young Yark in on some secrets. Okay, so as a kid, you were very interested in math and these these kinds of things that maybe kids that age aren't aren't so interested in. And then I understand you moved from Poland to the U.S. to complete high school. What was that like? What was the most surprising thing about that transition? Hmm. Uh, so. Let me be first tell why I've moved to Lagos High School. Like, yeah, the Polish high school is breaking my butt. It's as boring and uncreative as it is. You know, like you learn by memorization. That always got me in trouble with a lot of teachers, right? Uh, because I was smart, but also very stubborn uh, and had my own ways of doing things. Um, and I just found there's like this uh, Kennedy program in the US, like they admit uh, international students to most of the high schools. So I tried my luck. And ended up in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. So that's, hey, first big surprise. Not all the US is the skyscrapers and like uh, chasing the dream, right? Some of this is quite laid back, but I actually really enjoyed that. And believe me or not, like I got so deep into the country music in Oklahoma. Uh, it's like, absolutely, like <laughs> almost on the same shelf as uh, metal music for, for me nowadays. But what really surprised me, uh, despite, you know, like the high school education. We could say like the average is lower, but they are extremely open, like people, but also the education system is much more open than you expect. So uh, I went to some of classes, they were solving the personal classes, they were solving them in the head, right? Like, uh, because like the kid that was like, you know, from, from the childhood, right? It wasn't challenging for me. And when the Poland, they would make me suffer for that, right? Uh, they said, okay, you know, like, let's see what we can do with this kid. And they got me at the university classes in the morning. So I would drive the yellow bus. It would just like cause some route, off, but drop me at the University of Oklahoma. I would stay there for four hours and then ride back to the high school in the small town uh, in Oklahoma, you know, like for the rest of the classes. Some of which, by the way, I had to take on the computer because they weren't on the right time, right? And, and it all was possible in a small high school in the laid back country of like some village of 5,000 people, or maybe you call it like town, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And it literally blew my mind because um, on one side, it's not what we expected, but also it's not what we expected. So it's surprises all the way. And I think it's really interesting part of actually experiencing other people's lives because like I'm transitioned there. Like I'm kind of like in these people's shoes as well, right? Uh, like the stranger. So it's really eye-opening. Man, amazing. Okay, so... You go to this high school in Oklahoma, and like 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 a lot of people, uh, there's the po in the U.S. There's a possibility. There's like a spectrum of things. You could be in the middle of Manhattan, nothing but skyscrapers, or you could be in a five thousand person town in Oklahoma. When you got there, were there uh, were there people running around the high school like wearing cowboy hats, just so we can gauge what kind of high school this was? <laughs> Did you have actual high schools in this, or actual cowboys in this high school? Some, a, a, a few. Um, so okay. that's another thing that actually was surprising that the U.S. high school is very stereotypical, like exactly as you see them in the movies, you know, like the uh, football jerseys or whatever the season is, like they have the seasons for different sports. Uh, but there were a few people who were living like in the deep country, right, actually having the uh, ranchos and whatnot. And yeah, they wore, you know, like the... Uh, appropriate cowboy, cowboy or uh, cowgirl boots and sometimes you could spot you know like a hat so it was quite uh, fun <laughs> i mean fun in a positive way i wouldn't love that it actually looked pretty cool Ama amazing okay this is, this is amazing okay so okay so you go you go to this five thousand person town high school in oklahoma then what happens next uh well well that's a complex question so like i finished this high school a year early, like because like okay. we have to just meet the credit requirement, and I had quite a lot of credits from the Polish high school, and then also if you see what you need to do, like you can just finish it all in a year, like if you really want, which is another amazing thing that's possible, right? And then like I'm uh, left with one year of F1 visa, what to do, right? And 
this teacher from the university actually graduated in MIT. He wrote me a very strong letter of recommendation to MIT. Uh, so I went there, uh, invited to go to some classes, but then you know, like you get to know people and then you get to crash on their couches, etc., for the rest of the year, which is also amazing because people are so open and supportive. Like, can you imagine like you live out in a dormitory, you have a small room and you have like some strange kid to crash on your couch, right? And you smuggle them to the cafeteria to get a lunch as well. That was me for the entire year. And oh, yeah. uh, the crazy part is, um, like, I got into the MIT and the Harvard and some other evil leagues, but because I went to the lecture, there's no way I'm going to pay for that. Like, they wanted me to pay, like, the partial cost. So I've been mm. out to Scotland. At the nice. Of Denver. Nice. Prob probably, probably a good move as far as the numbers go. I, I like this. <laughs> I like this. Now we've got AXO, and even back then, you were already thinking about financial financial numbers. This is great. So, okay, you go to Scotland, and I understand you studied in, in Scotland at the University of Embra with a name that will probably be familiar to a lot of people in Cardano. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I got into my first class of the first year uh, called Functional Programming, and there is Fid Wadler standing there to teach us uh, Haskell. And that's, I think, one of the incredibly amazing things when you go to the University of Denver, that at least from the Haskell perspective, you go across so many people who both created the language and continue creating that and also work on uh, very advanced research way beyond that, uh, and that you got to interact with those people. And uh, they are very interesting for many different reasons. Like the first one, they're just interesting personally, really great uh, teachers and professors. So Phil Wadler has amazing style. I don't know if you watch any of his videos, but uh, you know, like he has this famous, you know, like the Lambda Man symbol. So, you know, like, a specific, like if the topic is right in the lecture, he will just like tear his uh, shirt uh, from the top and is below, you know, like the Lambda Man uh, suit. Uh, and uh, he jumps a lot to actually intuit stuff. But actually, you know, like, that's the crazy thing about the science, because when you go into fundamental science, the truth is very simple, but it's also very hard path to get the simple truth. So if you have really great professors who like, you know, like eaten all their teeth and a lot of prosthetics on some topic, they see, you know, like the nature behind that so uh, firmly that, you know, they just can't accentuate it. Like, and you might even realize that accentuating some simple truth so hard, but after some time to get realized, wow, this is so fundamental. Like everything is built on this black rock. You know, it's uh, it's amazing. Uh, I really enjoyed that. I actually took a lot of classes from him, uh, so including formal verification. And uh, well, then I could talk to you about uh, Cock and Zipper, but uh, the formal verification people have really ugly way of naming things or like very sexual action to it. You know, uh, so then he wrote the book about the. Uh, um uh, the formal verification in Agda. And that's actually how I got to know about Cardano. Like I was in the Haskell Love Conference 2019, chatting to him after the conference. And he says, you know, like, oh, you know, like, but I'm like verifying the Bluetooth score, you know, like uh, it's like they designed this language, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it's like, wait, what some crypto like layer one is doing all of this? This sounds both crazy compared to what I know about crypto right now. And it's also something that one should do if they want to do it right. And it blew my mind. And from that point, I started, you know, like diving into that. And that brought me over the long time to building a project on Cardano because there is like a ton of this very deep fundamental nuggets that are hidden in the language. And we sometimes speak of them. But the biggest one for me is off-chain computation, on-chain validation. And I know like it sounds basic, right? Why nobody did it before, right? Well, you have to have some big brain like Phil Waller, like those kiakis, you know, like they say, you, hey, well, you have to do it this way. I cannot even explain to you fully why yet, but this just makes sense, right, to do it this way. And then like you later go to see like all these benefits you can with really complex financial software without sacrificing the uh, trustlessness property that the blockchain gives you. That, that's really interesting. I, I remember um, years and years ago, years and years ago, before I, long before I had this channel, I was having a discussion with some people about Cardano. And of course, it was the typical, like very standard crypto conversation with standard crypto people. And they kept throwing all these random blockchains at me. 
and the thing, the, the conversation boiled down to me finally saying, you know, like, Hey, look, I, I love the underdog just like you guys do. I love some kid in his basement. And the example I was used, which is kind of ironic was Oklahoma, just because it's in the middle of the U S <laughs> the very middle, it was like some kid in his basement in Oklahoma, making a blockchain. I love that. But at the same time, I kind of trust these professors who've been doing computer science for decades a little bit more than that kid who's making a blockchain alone in his basement. Not that he can't produce a great blockchain that rivals the other blockchains, but if I'm going to pick a blockchain, I kind of trust these professors and the, the kid in his basement, maybe he'll make a great one, maybe he won't. But I have a feeling these professors know a little bit more about blockchains and creating a blockchain language and all these things. That was one of the things that first initially drew me to Cardano. And when I came into Cardano, I decided uh, it took a little while, but after a little while, I decided, okay, if I'm going to be spending so much time being so interested in Cardano, I should learn a tiny bit of Haskell. I should become the world's worst Haskell beginner, like literally the worst one in the world. That was my goal. Just become the worst Haskell beginner and probably stay that way forever. So I went through the first 400 pages of the Haskellbook.com. And the thing that struck me, struck me was I read the first, the first chapter after the first chapter, I felt super betrayed. So I read the first chapter. It was all about Lambda calculus. And at first I was pretty intimidated, intimidated because I had the word calculus in the title. And I was like, okay, I'm probably not going to make it to this chapter. And then I went through the whole chapter. I was able to do all the homework and I felt betrayed because I was like, why, why did I go through high school, college, grad school Never even hearing, never even knowing there was such a thing as Lambda Calculus. And in this one chapter, they showed me something brand new I had zero exposure to prior to that. What would you say about Lambda Calculus, just in the abstract for people who have no idea what it is? Like, why, why is it I was never exposed to Lambda Calculus prior to that book? So two separate questions. So let's first talk what's the Lambda Calculus. Uh, so when you want to fundamentally talk about what computation is, you need to have some model of what's doing the computation. And what most people have been exposed to is the Turing machine. So Turing machine is just like a tape. You can store something on this tape and you can move to the left or you can move to the right depending on the value that's on the tape. And that's it. And this simple model allows you to express any Turing complete program and what every Turing complete program is also equivalent to a program that we can give to you, to me, to somebody else, which is like basically a set of the instructions, which they're going to follow. And then in some number of steps, they're going to finish that. So it's like a computable problem. Um, and it's a very simple definition, very intuitive one. And also translates to a lot of used languages. However, at around the same time that Turing came with his Turing complete model, Alonzo Church came with his church model of the Lambda calculus. So that's basically, instead of having this memory-based model with this tape, he basically came with a very simple mathematical model where you have you know, like a few simple operations that allow you to also express the Turing complete program. And actually this correspondence, it's called a Turing Church uh, correspondence. And they basically literally describe both the same thing, a computing machine um, or Turing complete machine. And so like charge for being left out for the completeness theorem, right? But that's basically what it is. And there are two same ways talking about the same thing. However, those two things are fundamentally different. So if you guess a uh, Turing machine, then you go to completely different conclusion and completely different programming languages have very direct correspondence to that. And the same side on the Lambda calculus. And then, you know, like Haskell and the functional programming are extremely tied to the Lambda calculus because that's even how often they are implemented under the hood. Like when you look at the um, Haskell compilation pipeline at the same Sometime when it's like reduce the types of remove, etc. You look at that code, this almost looks like a lambda calculus. Um, and that's also an interesting thing because that's not the only area in science you do that and get a lot of value with that. You have two completely different mental models of thinking of the same thing. And depending which one you use, you can solve different problems much easier than using the other. And for instance, you do it comp all the time in the finance, for example, like when doing some proofs about stochastic property of options, you go from one mathematical space to the other, solve them much easier, and then go back <laughs> and continue. Um, and uh, just having different mental model uh, completely changes how you can solve the problem. 
and how you think about the problem. And for instance, like from my experience, this Turing model, like the imperative uh, object-oriented type of programming is very useful for memory-oriented fast computation, like really optimizing it. And that's like why I am more prevalent because you can write the software that performs better on average. However, uh, the functional programming is fantastic for writing the programs that break less often because then you have this easy isolation in the functions. You have like this tight interface between all of them, which are called the types. And then what's also fantastic, you know, like uh, if you write a very complex distributed code, uh, the functional programming code distributes this much more uh, easily. And then it ties into completely other areas of mathematics, for example, like category for you. So uh, probably I'm going to bore people to death, but you have the set theory on which mathematics is based, right? But the only right. way to base mathematics is actually category theory. And uh, instead of looking at sets, you look at the objects and the morphies between them. So it's like flipping it around instead of thinking of what's in the set. You are thinking how you're going from one set of types of objects to the other set of types of objects. And you can same way fundamentally build mathematics on that. And then again, in the process of doing so, you come across the so many other things you haven't come across with this set theoretic approach. And uh, this is also very close to functional programming and the lambda calculus. And it's just completely other way to think about that. Uh, Haskell is both a curse and a blessing <laughs> when you build those things because um, I won't talk even about the Haskell community because these are very special snowflakes for the most part, but there are like some amazing people in that. <laughs> but then it's so scientific that people often don't allow you to make it production. Uh, mm. like, and there are a lot of people in the community who are really deep into Haskell who have been trying for years to make it more production grade and they have been stopped at every stage. Uh, so, you know, amazing mental model, uh, very young programming language in the terms of being production grade. Uh, so, you know. So, very, very interesting. Thank you for that answer. That's by far the, the most uh, in-depth and understandable answer. It actually gave me the most information about that question uh, ab uh, about Lambda calculus and its relationship to Haskell, all those things that I've ever heard. I, I got into a little bit of trouble with my significant other when I was getting into mm -hmm. uh, that Haskell book because my significant other would start asking me, like normal, hey, can you? are you available on Saturday at this time? And that's kind of a normal question. But I found when I got to the uh, the types chapter in uh, the Haskell book, I started trying to define the activities a little more carefully. I'd be like, mm -hmm. okay, what type of activity are you trying to get me to go on? Could you define the parameters of this, this thing happening on Saturday a little bit more carefully? And, and uh, the significant other could not figure out why I was suddenly asking about types of activities, types of things they were they were requesting all the time. So could you go could you go into a little bit more depth on the this is something I think all of us in Cardano hear about a lot and we and I don't know if it's if everybody understands why it's so valuable to have the on-chain off-chain distinction in Cardano. Amazing question. Uh, but let me just tell you one more thing. Okay, uh, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Huge respect for going for the Haskell book first. It's not the easiest book to get into. It's like the book you get into that actually want to understand the Haskell is quite heavy. And I know the most people watching that won't know that. So a lot of respect for that. Go to haskellbook.com, check for yourself. It's one of the heavy books uh, to get into the Haskell. Um, so I absolutely love this topic. Um, so we are supposed to be building something that solves real-world problems. And real world is actually very complex. There's not much you can do with uh, automated market maker in the real world, right? Like when you would bring this to the bank, hey, I have this amazing liquidity making, do you want to use it? They would be like, what the hell are you talking about? It's like we did market better in the 16th century, right? Do you want us really to use that? Uh, and uh, that's just an example because there's like a lot of things like that. And when you think of the blockchain like Ethereum, uh, for a lot of interesting concepts that have to solve and bring through. So it's like a great experiment that has a lot of feedback flowing through that. It's actually not a great model for solving anything because 
fast. Uh, you will have people bidding more uh, for the time on this chain, right? So then, like by definition, you are going to spend because amounts of money because there will be times where there's a lot of money made just for being fast or being included in the block. So that's like the top price and the body is willing to pay. But the second, most importantly, you know, like this is the centralized system, but the definition you are centralizing it, right? So everything on Ethereum is sequential. So you have a lot of pools that are solving this uh, challenge, right? But then they have to pack the block, right? So uh, this is very sequential in the nature. So it's also that not much that the blockchain can do. And then you come to the final point, you know, like which is uh, this computation uh, is very expensive. So we are running in on the most expensive computer in the world, the computer where each computation is repeated over and over. It's like the mega validator computer. You know, it's like you have thousands of uh, other computers just checking that this computer didn't uh, make a mistake or didn't lie to you, right? So uh, this is like literally the most expensive model of the computation, right? So uh, mm. is the big revolution about making the computation we used before. So like three times, 3,000 times more expensive, well, probably it's not a good innovation, right? So by this beautiful idea, hey, why not allow for arbitrary complex computation? So now we have this off-chain computation. So, you know, you, me, and about the else, some stake pool operator, random stake pool operator, mm -hmm. so they can perform a computation that like having access to the data on Cardano. And what they now propose to the network is not this whole computation, oh, do this crazy computation and see the result. No, it's like, okay, that's what I've came up with. And now there's some validation code on chain. And now I'm submitting this proof, which is usually much more lightweight than the actual computation. And check me if the result is correct. And especially this is powerful with zero knowledge and snarks. Uh, but even without that, you can do a ton of computation it is just a very simple answer. And I think Axel is a great example of that because we are market making in the future, like all these very complex parameter swaps against each other. So it's not an easy problem to solve. But at the end of the day, we only submit onto the chain that the transactions that should transpire. And we only submit the minimum proof that uh, is required for them to move forward. So you literally make uh, the problem that on the chain, you know, like would be uh extremely complex to solve like extremely expensive to pay for solving now suddenly very cheap to solve because the classical computers are already very cheap so we solve it cheaply and we let it network verify cheaply and this idea in its simplicity is something that makes cardano the first blockchain that actually is enables real finance to be done on it uh, it's still not in the perfect shape, but it's actually something that I wouldn't be ashamed to go to uh, my friends in traditional finance that have this like business power to actually suggest things and onboard them and actually suggest them to go with that because this is actually something that works. That's that's a huge threshold, I think. Um, definitely, definitely a couple of, uh, several years ago. Uh, if I would have thought about that same question, at what point on the timeline do we get to a place where you could take any any product, any finance product in the in the blockchain crypto space to a traditional finance person and have them be satisfied to any degree? So I think it's a it's a pretty big it's a pretty big step forward uh, you're talking about. And in that direction, could you explain? I, I think I think most people now um, have heard about programmable swaps and the mitigation of impermanent loss in the context of AXO. Could you explain those two ideas in a way that people, in a way that people will, will understand? Sure. Uh, let's start with the impertinent loss. Um, impertinent, let me first explain what impertinent loss is, but not in the way that everybody heard that until now. Impertinent loss is a phrase that automated market maker had to invent to explain why almost everybody loses money. Because in traditional finance, you wouldn't call it uh, impertinent loss, we would just call it an inventory risk. And you, me, everybody else who trades, right? They have one of two simple goals. They either need a specific assets, you know, like, you know, maybe they're buying fuel, carbon offsets, who knows what. So they need a, have a need for a specific asset or they have much simpler need 
which is they just want to get richer in the terms of the settlement currency. And it may be ADA, it may be US dollar, it may be something else. But at the end of the day, we know what we want to have more of. And anything that we're doing in between is taking the risk to have more of it. So for instance, if I'm going now to take ADA and Hosky and do something with it, taking the risk, you know, like then Hosky is my environment, so it's my uh, inventory risk, because that's the asset that I'm only holding for the purpose of generating more ADA, right? So uh, now with AMM and impertainment loss, this is literally the worst situation it can be. So when the entire market, for instance, is going from Hosky into the ADA, which Hosky promised us a long time ago, but he cannot uh, never deliver, right? And Hosky being back to zero. But if suddenly everybody went from Hosky to ADA, so Hosky price drops, then what you are being left in that uh, pool is basically with just all the worthless Hosky. So that's literally the opposite that you should be doing. And when you think about the inventory risk, you say first, not like 50, 50%. This is like an absolute for anyone. You for instance say, okay, 80% and 20% Hosky, right? That's like the inventory risk I want to take. So 20% is your risk in that asset being Hosky, right? And now, uh, instead of just like shifting with the curve, you know, like uh, however it wants, you say, hey, I want to maintain this risk at 20%. It's not just like I'm starting there. I also want to be there all the time and to end there. So now, you know, like your market making can basically, so you have like in the order book, right? You have the uh, best bid and the best ask, right? So like the highest bid and the lowest ask and the price between them is the spot. So the spot price is technically what the market uh, price is. There are different ways to do that is the simplest one. And then when you look from the spot price, if you have too much Hosky, what you would you do is like you would shift your spot price around which you market make. And this is called then reservation price. So it's not like the spot price, it's your reservation price. So the price around which you make the market. And this basically leads to gradually losing the too much Hosky you have, or actually gaining back the Hosky that you lost because maybe people were so interested in Hosky. But then you do it much smarter way. So like you control your control your inventory risk, but hey, I said like 20%, this itself can be a variable, right? So let's say you actually look at the order book of Husky, right? And then you look at the size of the order book, right? Like what's the demand for buying and selling? And maybe you adjust your risk based on that because like if it's really balanced, well, maybe then you are willing to take more risk, right? Or uh, if it's suddenly going down, maybe you want to have some protection, right? So maybe, you know, like if something is going on with the market, then you uh, trade it less aggressively or even break a fuse, right? So let's say the price of Hosky drops more than 20% in a day, then you just break the fuse, automatically sell the Hosky, go full into data. And all of what I've described uh, is already possible with Prambu Swap. And I, of course, I know you have to take my word for that, you know, like we're not that uh, trusting in the blockchain, but uh, that's literally what the Prambu Swaps by definition enable you to do. Excellent. I I, ever since I heard you uh, describing impermanent loss as just kind of being the AMM invented terminology for that specific type of inventory risk, I've been stealing that for conversations outside of Cardano. Anytime anybody talks to me about impermanent loss for like last week, I've been like, oh, oh, you mean inventory risk? <laughs> <laughs> nice they all kind of like look at me like, what are you talking about? And then I launch into exactly the explanation you gave on the bull bullish dumpling space. So that's that's been, th thank you for that. That's been very useful. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of, okay. So you spent time, uh, if I understand correctly, you spent time at JP Morgan, Citadel, UBS, and of course the entire Cardano community has been highly amused by the trad tells you guys have put out. How would you sum up your time in traditional finance? Is there anything interesting to say about whether the mainstream public over or underestimates the general goodness or evilness of the traditional finance world? Oh, so much. Uh, this is a brilliant question because I think I have a chance to break a stereotype. So I think I will surprise a lot of people. So bear with me. I actually think that at the current time, traditional finance is much, much, much less evil than the crypto space. <laughs> and I have to explain why now, of course, right? Oh, wow. So okay. Everybody is ready to throw stones at me. Everybody's uh, shocked. Yeah, for sure. Everybody is shocked <laughs> at home. Okay, keep, go keep going. This is great. <laughs> uh, so, you know, like the entire world is not by nature evil. There's some really evil actors because they have to benefit from what they're doing, right? But like when you look at these banks, etc., this 
they're made of normal people. Uh, so 80% of all the traditional institutions, they're not able to an extent, right? Uh, they're just following what they have to do. They're following all the rules, right? Very diligently to have say so because there are very serious consequences to not following them, much higher than in crypto. And now, of course, there is gray area and this gray area, of course, is very catastrophic, right? So you have those large traditional finance institutions really intermingling with the governments. So now they have so much power and, you know, like with much power, I guess, comes great exploitation. Uh, so that's when the thing starts to break. And also there is a huge opportunity that sometimes arises. So there's like a lot of stories of the trading desks, for example, like the 4 billion, you know, like a uh, trading assignment and doing something crazy that, you know, like brought uh, entire markets or entire companies down. Uh, so, but this is isolated and rare. And usually as the effect of that, I wouldn't want to say technically it becomes, um, more anti-fragile. So the anti-fragile comes from uh, this concept that, for example, like the planes, when they crash, there's so much engineering that goes on top of that, that it doesn't crash in the future, that the planes are becoming more anti-fragile every time the plane crashes. And the same happens to the financial system. The only reason I put a stake is that it just sometimes comes so much regulation that you can no longer do the things that people need you to do. Uh, but this is pure government intervention. I actually want to start this conversation because I want to point the finger at actually who truly is evil. In my opinion, the truly evil uh, actor is the government because uh, like, look at that, like a um, long time ago, like f I think five centuries ago, you know, like uh, you had fiat money, actually not fiat money, you had the backed money from the private institutions. So then you had the competition between institutions, hey, who is more trustworthy? So you really couldn't afford to become trustworthy because then you were out of the business. And that's like usually much higher cost than uh, just robbing everybody with the raising the deposit. Uh, but then comes the government, which actually has the power to do that. Hey, you know what? Like now the only allowed money is our government money. And people say, oh, okay, you know, maybe it simplifies the things. We just have one money. I don't have to check, you know, like if this bank is from this trusting counterparty or not. So people agree to that, right? But then the government says, hey, you know what? Your money is worth nothing, but you have still to pay the taxes for that. And, you know, like 40% of the money that people pay on average in the world is taxes, right? So it's the biggest use of money. So, hey, good luck with that, right? Now you have to use our worthless money. Uh, and... A lot of this mechanics usually like leads to all these issues we have in the world. And same like with the COVID pandemic, we've seen like really poor performance, I think on all governments part, which put the world into the recession. Like we now enter into recession. It's like crazy to believe that it's all because of COVID, right? Um, and, or you had, you know, like governments printing so much money that suddenly they cannot deal with the crisis because they no longer have this flexibility. And uh, I think even like a lot of evil that comes from the channel finance companies comes from government in two forms. The first form uh, is basically creating the situation that's broken, that's basically like leads to broken things. And like you had like this credit default swaps, right? Uh, so that's some seed that then takes every people to completely break the system. But of course, you know, like the financial people are going to make everything to make money, including breaking the system. You are thinking this may break. But the uh, other one, and actually much more malevolent, malevolent one, is uh, it creates situation where exploitation is legal. So it creates a system in which uh, some specific predatory mechanisms can thrive, and where the competition for this predatory system is very hard to create. And you know, like my example uh, is market making, because to be a market maker, you have to have multiple billions of dollars to go into the traditional finance market. Uh, so it's something that's unpenetrable. You cannot penetrate this market like it's unpenetrable. And uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, Robin Hood can sell the uh, order flow to Citadel Securities for $700 million. And Citadel can easily make five, six times on that. They actually call it absolute return strategies, which basically means no matter what happens, they make money. A abs absolute return strategies. Yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and 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 now because crypto is not regulated, all those companies, the same ones and the new ones, are already in crypto. But in crypto, you can do so much more, especially you know, like when you can do MEV and everything else. 
Uh, and now it brings me to watch more like crypto is evil because you have the same actors who have the same methods of operations, but crypto now allows you to do much more. And I'm not saying, oh, let's regulate the crypto, right? But what's enough would be enough in this case to be just much more uh, conscious consumer, right? Because how does crypto trading really works, right? 95% of crypto trading happens on centralized exchanges. So we come and say, hey, centralization is fantastic, freedom from the government. And then we go trade 95% of that on centralized exchanges. Like, where is logic in that, <laughs> right? Uh, and they understand that. And they understand, you know, like how to uh, tickle everybody, you know, like little demon, you know, hey, how to get you to do more of that or that. So, you know, like, uh, for instance, uh, BlockFi says, oh, stake with us. It's staking. It's not lending. It's staking, right? And you get 6% uh, of Bitcoin per year, right? And then they go borrow it to three arrows, and then the arrows land into the ground with your money, right? And then it turns out that uh, BlockFi debt was the most junior debt possible, so everybody gets paid before the actual uh, lender, which is insane. Lender always gets paid first in traditional finance, right? But mm -hmm. only in crypto, you can do those crazy things. And then uh, we have all these ideas, you know, like, of course, open sourcing helps a lot of decentralization because I don't have to go and decipher the code in Siebel format or some other format, what it actually means, right? I can actually just see the code directly. It makes the work of public verification easier. Uh, however, then you have an army of uh, bracketing scammers. They take Uniswap code, they take other code, they slap the poop logo on it, and they meet a new token, and suddenly you know, you have a sushi swap, a vampire attack, and they have other vampires attack. And uh, all those attacks literally remove the oxygen from the uh, protocols and companies and people who are actually doing the innovation because, you know, like this money is energy, right? So if people actually are thinking that, hey, copying that actually is a great business idea, the market should now divide equally, you know, like just between something that just literally copied the code, maybe with understanding without, without who knows, right? And somebody who came with the idea and has already like a working product because they're just offering the tokens and like they're dropping them, etc. So this is like exploitation of the uh, natural human tendencies, which we have to control because we're intelligent. So intelligence is ability to control those emotions and uh, think for ourselves and think of the higher level than the simple gains. And unfortunately, even I don't think people were in the beginning. Like, I think it's actually the process that happened over the time uh, with those marketing people coming over playing the market and everybody got used to the point that there is just some token that's being shielded. You get at the bottom, you sell it at the top. Usually it's the opposite, right? Because, you know, like when the shield comes to you, you know, then it's already too late. Uh, so we're literally buying the last. Uh, but then also that's why we get so many jokes. You know, it's like, oh, I have a great crypto trading strategy. You know, like I buy a high SLO, right? And that's what often happens. And the crazy part is the entire space has been embedded so deeply with bad actors, right? Like we know all these like 5 million views YouTubers that are literally shilling a coin after other coin or this big profiles on Twitter. Uh, and this sells so well because people are thinking they're getting financial advice, right? Uh, where they're getting advice uh, how somebody can screw them over. Uh, and at the same time, you know, and it's actually Extremely, I'm happy that the channels like yours, right, exist because they're absolute voice of reason. But then it's like, why aren't they more popular, right? Like you're actually talking about the truth, how the things are, you know, like this the sound of the reason in the people's head. And I'm just like talking to you, there's like other people like you, but like all, you look all of them, right? And they have uh, nowhere compared audience reach, right, to those shield channels. Like what is wrong? with us <laughs> like, why, oh, why man. We, we like this i get so many messages i get so many messages from very well-meaning supportive people and i get these the messages always start out like hey i noticed x youtuber has like 10 times as many subscribers as you or 10 times as many views whatever it is they're like do you think you should do what do you think you need to do to get as, as big as those guys you know and like the answer the answer is often just like cover 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 the biggest blockchains and throw in a huge amount of charting 
like hitting those hitting those like those brain chemical buttons when people see the Fibonaccios being drawn on the charts. And it, it's like you said, like it's hard to make the case that these people aren't providing financial advice. And, you know, we have like in most in most like, you know, modern societies, we have like credentialing systems for providing financial advice. And I, I'm going to I'm going to guess that like zero percent of not zero percent, but the vast majority of the people doing all this charting and providing financial advice, drawing drawing all the Fibonaccios on the on the, the charts, many different variety of triangles that look like nacho chips. Um, and it, it's like that's what that's what hits that dopamine button for a lot of people in crypto because at the end of the day, people a huge proportion of people who get into crypto get into it because it's some kind of a, when they initially get in, they think of it as a kind of a get rich quick scheme of some type. And then they go through a bear market and it becomes like a get rich quick, get rich, not so quick scheme. And then it's like, let's just try to get rich on some timeline, but it's always there in the background. And then like, I think some portion of the people become interested in the fundamentals of what's going on in this whole crypto space, everything outside of the whole number goes up thing. But that's certainly not the thing that most intensely pushes that dopamine button that makes people really, really want to tune in to all the Fibonacci guys. And, you know, and it's funny because we, you know, even some of those guys, um, some of those guys are very nice guys. They're actually like very charming and very nice guys, but definitely they perfected uh, hitting, hitting the old dopamine button. So you, you talked a little bit about centralized lenders in crypto, which is always, that topic is always so amusing to me because I'll never forget one of my, one of my friends who outside of this is one of my smartest friends. I love having conversations with this guy, but again, years ago in 2018, he tried so hard, so hard. He tr made so many pitches on me for these decentralized lenders just to get me to give them my money because his returns were so excellent. I haven't talked to him after the three arrows thing when exactly what a lot of people suspected that a lot of that money was going to these entities that were doing the same DGEN stuff, you know, a lot of individuals in crypto were doing, but just on a massive scale with that money you were giving to the centralized lenders. I haven't talked to him since then, but on the topic of, of those kinds of returns, we've got this, we've got this, this staking in cardano which is people describe it as riskless or very low risk you know they have different ways of describing the risk level of staking in cardano how do you think that affects everything else in DeFi and cardano let me put it that way fantastic point i actually think it's very important that we talk about it as well uh, so let's imagine a situation in which we live in hypothetical country called Utopia. And now whenever we deposit money in the bank, we constantly take 5% of this money uh, more on the deposit. And of course, I know it's like now 4%, but let's pretend it's 5% uh, for, for, for the memory's sake. Uh, now, uh, how hard you have to compete with your innovations uh, to offer something that carries the risk that is interesting to people, right? So. You know, like if I can get 5% uh, riskless return, then like at least my low risk, even medium risk uh, uh, investments are going to be just, you know, like in Cardano. Like if it's like not fluctuating itself, uh, it's literally the situation as if the US government would come and say, hey, now the base interest rate is 5%. Literally, the uh, stock market would be decimated. It's already decimated, but imagine going up to 5%. That's where we are perpetually on Cardano. Good luck, Cardano projects. So, and I don't mean it like ironically because like really good luck because now you have Plutus, you have a lot of weird technologies that are still being developed and now you have to compete with that. And I think that's the primary reason for the TVL being below 100 million. And again, like TVL is stupid metric, right? But uh, that's the one which we can easily use to compare it to other blockchains, right? And I know on Ethereum it's more, right? And like we'll get around that as well, I uh, believe. But uh, that's something that makes innovation so much harder. And we can think of it like a dark forest, right? The dark forest full of the predators. But there's like one huge predator called 5% riskless return, right? Uh, so that's... Uh, a very, you know, like extreme evolution conditions for the projects. And uh, 
and that's also what people are finding. You know, it's like I actually, you know, like after some losses on some of the early projects, they're saying, I actually, I don't want to do it anymore. I'm going to go back to my nice 5%. And it's blessing and it's a disease. It's hard to decide which it is because on one side you want to have that, but also Cardano should be a thriving, healthy ecosystem with a lot of stuff built on that because if Cardano never has anything on it, it just has staking of the ADA, then I know some people may disagree, but like uh, it's almost worthless because I want to be able to do things with that. And again, like by things, I mean like even like integration with some traditional world, there has to be something in it that actually is like the value in the system itself or on the edges of the system, right? So, you know, it solves some real world problems and, uh, you know, uh, it's just so much harder. And actually, I think we should also touch another thing, you know, like uh, despite Cardano actually being built of a lot of smart people, like when I look at the Cardano community, I am proud because on average, it's smarter than other critical communities, like way smarter. It's like comparing cucumbers to monkeys, right? Monkeys are much smarter than cucumbers. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, if, and sorry, I'm not, I don't mean it in a negative way. I just mean like the comparison, right? Uh, right, 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 right. Yeah. One piece to people or something like that. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, but but then, you know, like uh, where do we go from there? Uh, like the 95%, I don't know, maybe my assumption is wrong, of the people's money went to scams. The early scams in Cardano, I know, it's like promising the heaven. And I, of course, know it's very hard to say which one is which. I'm just only talking about the post-mortem, which is all this money evaporated because you not only have 5%, you only have the 5% that remains, right? Which is a tough conditions, but, you know, like, I just want to say one thing. It's like, I'm also very happy that there are still so many strong projects going uh, because I think a lot of them are going to survive the bear market and the best projects are done in the bear market uh, because again the, the extreme conditions right you have to be fit to survive uh, and also you have to become even fitter uh, so interesting times there's a lot of good things coming but also i think that's very important to probably try to change the mindset that we have because this you know like fibonacci and other people like they make us convinced that we should expect everything today just to be able to flip the token but the real complex stuff that we actually want that actually delivers the long lasting value uh takes time to build you know like uh, i think the most tangible example of that is what mobile token where they're building something in the real world yeah. it's a great analogy of how complex it is to build something that have a lasting value and uh you know, like either we can have uh, the same circles as Ethereum has and other uh, so Lunavax, or we can have a serious blockchain that, you know, like when we go to people with the real money, and I don't want to describe the, the money we have as a retail, institutions have most of the money that's investable, like 90, 95%. Like, yeah. And and that's like and if you want Cardano to succeed, right? You want them to start onboarding it as well. And then when you're really successful, uh, for example, like when uh, the equity market is digitized on Cardano, and then those all retirement funds are buying this on Cardano because it's transparent, right? And they have self auditing code. You know, it's like it's not code. They have a full audit on the blockchain exactly what they have done and that's like not shady at all right it brings value to people right and then it's like when the first of them start doing that then it's like that there will be question hey why are you not doing that like i'm going to go to the one that actually doing that it gives me the extra level of transparency yeah super super interesting i i i still like one of the one of the points you made about the strength of a lot of the projects on cardano i was really struck when having gone through the 2017 ico craze and parabolic high and then crash afterwards um when projects first started launching on cardano or just just the inception of the projects when we first started seeing catalyst projects being pitched i was sort of like here we go 
how many, how much of this is going to look like 2017? This is going to be bad. And I was very pleasantly surprised. I mean, we do, of course, it's a blockchain ecosystem. So we're going to have some of that. But I've been very pleasantly surprised at how many of the projects are pretty much doing what they said they, they were setting out to do, even back in those early days. Like we, it definitely seems like we have a lot of strong projects. And it does feel really different than if we were in uh, a Salunavax ecosystem or an Ethereum. Um, I, Man, in my normal life, almost no one knows about this channel, and there are a lot of reasons for that. But one of the reasons is that I get sick of going to parties and having people introduce me as some kind of crypto person and then having to defend crypto on the basis of what people know about the Salunovax ecosystems and Ethereum. And it's it's not even worth the effort. So I usually I have many, uh, many deceptive ways of describing what I do for a living. So I don't have to get into the crypto conversation based on what people know about uh, Salunovac systems and Ethereum. But speaking, speaking of projects, what do you think is the emerging growth area in DeFi that will surprise everyone by 2027? So we're thinking like five years out, half a decade out. What will people be surprised about in DeFi? That's a fantastic question, but I also want to segue it from what you have said, because actually my answer is going to be connected. Uh, okay. Crypto kind of became the regulatory term because I feel exactly same like I wouldn't want to say to somebody with whom I want to discuss serious business and describe myself as a crypto person because they're going to think I'm an idiot. And also when you're in this space, when you're talking to professional companies and you describe yourself as a crypto, something, then they think you're going to try to take you automatically for the right. And yep. uh, what I've seen as an interesting trend, the serious companies that are entering the space, I mean, like, and the crazy thing is like we're not even seeing them because they are hiding so well and doing their business. But they always say they are digital assets companies. And that actually, I think, is the amazing segue into what you ask. It's what's going to be here in five years. And my opinion is, like, we are going to digitize everything on the planet, right? Why the heck this crude oil is not digitized yet? Why uh, all the equity markets are not digitized? Why all the commodity markets are not digitized? Why all this very hard to digitize thing as a simple certificate is not digitized? So, you know, like... Like the great example is uh, CO2 offset, right? It's something that you dynamically produce. Uh, it's not easy to do in the traditional finance world. And then this is really set to sound like as the internet revolution because now suddenly everything is digitized. Everything is accessible. Everything now has somebody's custody and you don't have to release that custody to come into the interactions. And then, you know, like if you add uh, not full transparency, because it's crazy if somebody would be able to go and see my full shopping history on Amazon, but if you add gradual transparency, so for instance, you know, like you are some large company and now you want to show uh, that, for example, you bought the right amount of the CO2 offsets, right? I, uh, that's brilliant if you can do that. Uh, but you probably don't want to show all the details and it goes into all other areas. So for me, it's actually digitizing and our economics, but this is also something that really like, excites me personally and also really scares me. And uh, for one simple reason, like we talk about the uh, cucumbers, monkeys and Cardano and everything else. And if, uh, you know, the cucumber people, you know, like are going to decide for us, you know, like what's the future they're going to jump into, you know, like the uh, centralized digital bank uh, currencies and they're going to jump into the other side because now on the crypto, they uh, the preachers now say, hey, the centralization is not important, right? The only important thing is that my Ethereum goes up, right? Uh, so uh, this is really scary because Ethereum is the perfect blockchain for doing this centralized uh, currencies. And they are going to be much worse than USDC or USDT, where they can literally blacklist you. Uh, they literally will be able to automatically take money off of your account if they don't like you, or they will be automatically able to punish you. You cross the red uh, light, right? Like on the street and, hey, punk, automatic deduction from your wallet, right? Without your question. You don't even have to pay the bill. You don't even have option to argue. Point, about point on one ether, point on one ether, <laughs> subtracted from your account. You, you, <laughs> you walked you walk when the walk signal was off. Uh, I, I probably even better though, like uh, one liter off, uh, 0.1 charge, 0.9 gas fee. 
<laughs> oh yeah <laughs> even worse even worse your gas fees are perpetually higher because you're a chronic jaywalker <laughs> even worse uh, to, to collect it quickly we said that gas uh, fee uh, highly for your convenience uh so that's a very scary alternative because uh technology as a technology uh it's just a container. We're talking about the Turing complete machines. We talk about the Lambda yeah. calculus. So all containers. And this technology has been created. It's just a container. And now we can do with this container, this uh, Orwellian uh, Huxley mm -hmm. type of the world, or we can create amazing world where everything is easy to access, where we have actually access to the information, etc. And there is very one simple rule that's going to decide that. And that's why it's so scary because it's, very hard to play where it's going to go. And this rule is exactly the same rule on which any republic in the world has been established. It is the rule of the people, by the people. So if we all collectively as people are conscious enough what each of those means, and we are going to take actions that are based not on our simple short-term monetary gains, which are usually losses, by the way, uh, but we focus instead on actually building the better future, well, then we're going to get better future. And it's like a crazy thing because like, I don't want to call people consumers, but I think it's good to call them like easier in this context because it's crazy how much power consumers have, right? Because yeah. if people would say they're not going to buy the next iPhone, if it's going to look exactly like the last one, well, then Apple would actually make the iPhone that looks different, right? And mm -hmm. that's the crazy thing. And literally customers collectively kind of like decide the future because everything that isn't that future is going to die and everything that's that future is going to survive and thrive. Uh, so I think definitely the future is completely digitized, but now is it dystopian future or is it bright future? It's for us to decide. Definitely. That, that, that makes me think of a lot of different things. I like, I like two of the distinctions you made. One was sort of um, uh, expressly put, and the other one was sort of implicit. I'm definitely going to start referring to people as cucumber people. I like that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think in crypto, we definitely encounter a lot of cucumber people. And I also like the implicit distinction you made. I like that you described everything as a digitization and not as a tokenization. A few years ago, we talked a lot about tokenization of everything, sort of before we got into the the crazy, all the crazy predatory things that were hap that have been happening over the like la last he half decade. And tokenization sounded like something very hopeful and positive. And then tokenization just became sort of a tool of the financial predators who flooded into our space. I love that you're describing it as digitization because the mainstream has already seen the digitization of so many things, the internet revolution, email, all of those things. So digitization is largely going to be seen as, you know, something positive where I think tokenization has taken on some negative connotations. So I like that you used the uh, digitization terminology. Uh, I think it definitely has much better connotations, much more hopeful. So on, on the topic, we, we sort of already delved into the topic of this, this, um, this dystopian Orwellian future. Do you think I'm I'm pretty afraid um, that the I'm afraid how big the utility use case of CBDCs for the central banks is all the behavioral economic stuff because I think they I think I think that years ago they figured out they can engage in behavioral economics at a level that would have been impossible or much, much more complicated with fiat currencies. How much do you think their use case, obviously there's efficiencies involved in what they're doing, but how much do you think they're thinking about behavioral economics? And by that, I mean, even just simple use cases of incentivizing one part of the population, like, hey, we want retirees to be spending and not saving, or we want young people to be saving and not spending. So we're going to give them different inter interest rates to encourage spending versus saving, those kind of things. How much do you think central banks are thinking about those kinds of things right now in terms of their exploration in CBDCs? And it seems like they're all exploring CBDCs. Um, that's the driftwood that can help them from drowning it. So they will all <laughs> latch to it so profusely that if that would be a person, that person would draw with them. And unfortunately, that drift with these people, with that which you described, right? Students, elderly, the middle class, everybody else in the between. 
like in the UK, right? Uh, there was the change of the government and they said they're going to lower taxes. Everybody became so skeptical that the UK treasury won't have enough money that the Bank of England had to go and buy a tremendous amount of bonds of the market because otherwise the retirement funds would collapse. And if we are at this situation now, uh, you know, like they are just dreaming of that driftwood to rescue them from the mess that they've created and allow them to latch to something for 10, 15 years more. And I know people may struggle to believe that's that bad. Yes, that's that bad. Like literally, that's why in the US, they are afraid to raise the interest rates to 12%, for instance. That's technically where they should be right now because they have such a large debt, they're afraid yeah. they wouldn't be able to service it. And at the same time, they're also giving away the money because midterms, right? So that's how the world works. Now, well, who do you get money from? Like, they take money from everybody in the world, right? So, like, the government takes the money from the people, right? So now, if they can very directly take the money from those people, well, of course, they're going to. And uh, this is not even some just imagination. So this is most easily imagined in the more... Um, more centralized, more dictatorial uh, countries, for example, like China already had digital yuan, and that was exactly the idea you described. Well, what if the money starts evaporating after some time? I think it was something like if you spend, don't spend it in a month, it starts disappearing from your account. So it forces the money to be spent. But we never ask the question, why do we even have to spend money all the time, right? Like this is literally just burning the world to the ground. And that was one of this like revolution with Bitcoin, like this financial supply. We can stop thinking about this as inflationary assets where we can cons where we have to constantly spend it because otherwise it loses the value. And inflation is, uh, by the way, already evaporating value, right? Because the next year something is going to be worth, uh, no, my money is going to be worth 5% less or 100% less uh, if I'm in Argentina, right? Uh, so it's not 100%, it's like uh, be worth half of that, so 50%. It's just like inflation is 100% higher over a year. Uh, so now that's another way to remove the money from people. So absolutely, all the governments are dreaming of that. And for a very simple reason, they are, and sorry for uh, swearing, uh, they are in a deep doo-doo. Uh, and the only way for them out of this doo-doo is stepping on everybody's backs. Uh, and dragging them into that uh, doo-doo with themselves. Um, and uh, yeah, it's crazy and scary. Uh, I hope CDBCs never happen. Uh, and if they happen, it's just going to be flat amount, like literally digitized currency, nothing more, nothing less. Do you think, do you think over the next 10 years, this gets bad enough for the central banks that we see any kind of sort of pendulum swing away from modern monetary theory and towards something that even resembles Austrian economics? Do you think we see a swing a swing in that direction? Or do you think they're so deep in modern monetary theory? I mean, they gave Bernanke the Nobel Prize, for God's sakes. Do you, think, do you think they're so deep in modern monetary theory they can never swing back? Or do you think there might be a chance of a dose of Austrian economics being injected back into the behavior of the central banks? So... As scary as the thought it is, right? The only time we have the regime changes is big crashes. So if the entire monetary system the world crashes, well, then they have opportunity to replace it. However, uh, and I'm usually optimistic person, so it says something. I don't think that would be with something else, Austrian economic school or something similar. I think that would be replacing that with the World Economic Forum agenda, which is, uh, you know, you have 100 uh, huskies to spend a month. Um, and if you don't spend them on vegetables and public transport, then we are going to deduct half of that. And by the way, you are breathing out CO2, so we better start buying the, your personal offsets as well. Uh, I, I think that's more likely outcome of the crash, especially because this crash is going to affect the most vulnerable first. And that's a perfect chance for them to put the leash on everybody's neck. Uh, and this leash can be so tight that we may never escape it or it's going to take a serious you know, like revolution to overthrow it. And that's crazy, right? That we got to this point that we're even thinking it's possible because for me, 
how this system should really exist, it's that if somebody would say that, we would say, hey, this is not possible because blah, 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 right? But our system got to such point that this thought is feasible. And the feasibility of this thought is the most scary thing because if it's feasible and you go to the World Economic Forum website and they have all those things listed there publicly for everybody to see and they've been experimenting with it for many years. A lot of governments are, you know, like uh, amoring with this idea then, you know, uh, maybe they're going to be introducing it by, by one. Uh, you know, Sri Lanka uh, government bankrupt because they went fully organic. Right, and for what we can say, okay, well, organic food maybe is great, but also if you have eight billion of people to feed, you know, like not everybody may be able to get an organic food. I'm personally going to start doing videos that are very positive on the WAF, and then uh, spamming them with emails, trying to lobby them to get a larger allotment of tokens in their CBDC, <laughs> so I can buy more bugs. I, I want to be the guy who has like pounds and pounds of the bugs. And then I'll be selling them in the neighborhood around here because I got the, the special allotment from the WEF. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> well, but, you know, make sure to ask for the beef flavored uh, back powder. Yeah, that's right. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, re I'll request the premium cricket powder, the beef flavored. <laughs> okay. What do you think is the emerging growth area in crypto outside of DeFi? that could surprise everyone in the next five years? I like, I like the digitization answer, and that kind of applies to this question too. Is there anything else you see as emerging right now in crypto outside of DeFi? A lot of things. I just don't know how much I can talk about because uh, some of those things, uh, I don't know if they are public yeah. yet, but let me describe okay. in a higher level. Um, okay. So there is a ton of traditional uh, business um, trying different things uh, that is equivalent to, for example, like using uh, digital identity. And I think IMX is a great example of that. They, I think working with 39 telecoms, which is a perfect example, you know, like what we're talking about. Like imagine uh, now this almost a billion people network is connected to crypto. This is huge, right? Or now let's think we digitize those assets and we create the currency that's backed by something, right? So for instance, let's say, I, I know we don't like crypto, but it's such a huge market, it's very easy to talk about, right? Right, right. right. We will take uh, 10 trillion of the crude oil and we create a currency backed by that crude oil. So it's like the federal system, you know, like where you deposit something into it and you create the money this way, but then this is actually backed by something real. So we have a fantastic, uh, opportunity to create something tangible that changes our lives for better and then in this fragile times you know it's the most beautiful idea like we never as people had this opportunity before always so like when you look historically right like possession of something was privilege so like you have feudalism there were number of privileged people who could own something then you have the merchant class in the cities okay but then you had, you know, like the Republic, it's just everybody can own something, but it's still, you know, for somebody to decide what are the rules of the ownership, etc. We arrive at the first time in the human history where we can remember 24 words in our heads. And literally the moment we die, we take that wealth with us to the grave. So it's literally the wealth is in us. And this is amazing. And this, this gives us power, right? Because now uh, if... People actually would see crypto for what it is, right? And this actually can be done by a lot of cryptos, but Cardano is just uh, probably better than all of them for that. So, you know, like let's say we actually all collectively decide that, hey, screw all this stupid fiat. We're not going to exchange to the dollar, right? We actually trust Cardano more. We're going to exchange to ADA. And now, you know, like suddenly this is money that they cannot confiscate from us as long as we don't agree to that confiscation. So the only thing they can do is they can uh, hold a $5 wrench to our heads and scream for the seed phrase, but it's for us to decide if we're going to give it away. It's immense power. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Let me ask this question. Given everything we've talked about, if everything goes well, if everything goes as well as it possibly could for Cardano, and if everything goes as well as it possibly could for Axo, is there a chance 
that AXO is going to change the world of finance, not just DeFi, but finance generally, if everything goes as well as it possibly could? Yes, uh, fundamentally. So AXO, especially the concept of parameter swaps, completely flips on its head uh, how the trading is done currently. So first, most important of all, uh, by definition, the trades are forced to execute fail. And there's a very specific definition for fairness, which is the best offer and within the best offer the first time the information was revealed. And I know it may sound so simple, but you only think it's simple until you realize that non-market in the world is actually fair. It's screwed in some sense. And now what's more, Pramble Swap actually are a very easy interface for all institutions on the planet to integrate into one network. And within Pramble Swaps, another interesting concept is uh, this is the actual code that lives on the exchange because normally when you're actually deploying a complex trading strategy, this is the code that lives outside of the exchange. So you like with the data from the exchange and then you submit you know, like market limit orders very fast to change something. This is actual code that lives in this trading protocol, like weaving. So this uh, completely shifts on the head how the trading is done. And if everything goes well for AXO, then all the trading on the planet is going to done, be done on the AXO uh, or AXO equivalent because the AXO is to tell like the limit of how you can make the trading fair and efficient from everybody's perspective. It doesn't have to be high frequency, right? But if it's fair, then you don't care about high frequency so much as long as it's timely with the other parts of the market. Uh, and actually, we are in a lot of interesting talks uh, that would literally bring onto the blockchain the volume trade higher than the entire uh, market cap of all cryptos. So not Whoa. a trillion, not two trillions, 10 trillions plus. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Okay. So, for people who don't know, um, I, I think a lot of people probably know, but for people who don't know, this is kind of astonishing. Could you describe exactly what goes on with high frequency trading? <laughs> sure. So, uh, first, you buy the direct mark uh, exchange access. So, it's called DMA, direct market access. So, let's say I buy direct access to the New York Stock Exchange. So, I go there, put my. Uh, this like little box, I put like a lot of Hello Kitty stickers on it that nobody sees what's inside. And then I put really beefy electronics inside that sees the market in a blimp, like literally like you cannot uh, blink so fast as the market executes. So like in the moment you blink, like probably a million trades went by from this collocation. Uh, and this market making, what it does, you know, like we talk about payment for the order flow when they're like making six times money on you, absolute uh, return strategy. Well, now multiply it to the point where a million of trades takes microseconds. And not only that, you have literally a straight cable from Chicago to Newark because like most of the uh, trading exchanges are in Newark, not in actual New York City. Um, and now there are micro trades and everything else try to compete with that, like nobody can. And that's literally most of the trading on the planet is done in this fashion. And you can call it like gatekeeping, you can call it uh, involuntary haircut, but that's <laughs> what happens at every step. And this is also very limiting because this allows a lot of very unfair dynamics and it doesn't allow the dynamics the market wants. So uh, there's like a lot of really interesting dynamics with Preamble Swaps. Uh, so. One actually that uh, Mark uh, mentioned to me recently was a uh, request for quota. So usually you have the problem, you have some asset to buy or sell that you don't know how it is priced. So you want to do request for quota. Actually, the AXO is the first protocol, actually the first financial system in the world where you actually can have direct requests for quota. And there's like a lot of these things that because this, it's like, you know, Turing complete, Lambda calculus, right? Etc. cetera, parable swaps. It's such an interesting model that it literally shifts your thinking. And this allows you to express things like we haven't been expressing before. Uh, and this has a uh, huge potential. It has, I don't want to say that because this sounds extremely self-loving, so I'm going to send it anyway. So we have to forgive me for that, I hope. No, not, not at all. Keep going, this is great, this is great, keep going. <laughs> so, 
so the moment Einstein came with the general uh, theory of relativity, like we went from uh, navigating by stars and the map to navigating by GPS, because to use GPS, you actually have to factor the effects of the relativity. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And this is literally you, similar. I, I, I love this. Could you, could you explain to people how that works with the uh, GPS satellites and having to use uh, the theory of relativity to calculate? Could you just explain that to people? Real? We don't have to go into detail, but just, just explain to them what's going on there. Absolutely. So uh, your position on Earth is triangulated. So you have to have three satellites that you are connected to, and you basically measure the time it takes for the uh, signal to go from your phone to the satellite and back. And this uh, has this relativistic effects because the satellites are so far and they're traveling on the Earth's orbit that the moment the satellite communicates its position in the sky uh, is going to be completely different when you arrive at that. So it has all these like, relativistic effects, like the distance is large enough and the satellite moves quickly enough that Basically, if you would just assume uh, the simple Newtonian model of gravity, so like everything is like a perfect straight line, uh, you would come with the answer which says, you know, like you're actually 100 meters from where you really are and you would be jumping random, right? Depending on what the kind of the error you get. Uh, but when you factor the relativistic effect, then you actually are able to pinpoint, you know, like exactly to half a meter. It's 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 amazing. The first time I, I I was amazed. The first time I uh the first time I I understood that I was completely amazed. So sorry for that aside, but I love I I, I love that uh that discussion. Okay, keep keep going, keep going though. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's in my opinion, you know, like uh that the this this model like opens completely new mental framework, and now we can go with this, and uh, actually it's interesting to explain it. the traditional financial model is very archaic. Uh, when you look exactly how the trading system works nowadays, it really dates back directly to uh, people standing on the street and shouting above each other, buy, sell. Uh, and then, you know, like, uh, actually people were standing on the Brooklyn Street. That's how the New York Stock Exchange started. And then they put people in the rooms above the street that would be waving some information to them that they got using the uh, telegraph. Uh, and then, you know, like they put the people in the pit, so it was slightly more organized, right? And then you have this, you know, like uh, dealers and brokers in the exchange standing around it then. Uh, and now a lot of things is digitized, but actually when you look exactly how it's built, it literally directly tracks to that mental model of people standing in the dirty street uh, in a complete chaos and shouting to each other. And uh, that's the trading model that the entire uh, trading system to this day is based on like fundamentally the model of exchange. Um, and this is really for overhaul with uh, something that, you know, like actually looks at it, you know, like Lambda calculus purely mathematically. We came with a few simple operations on which the entire new finance can be built. Uh, and it has a potential to actually uh, remove a lot of dust that shouldn't be there, clean it up, make it much more accessible to everyone and simplify it, make it possible to integrate, which is same like, you know, TCP IP protocol to an extent, you know, like everything that we do on the internet, except uh, streaming the video, like now, like it goes over the TCP IP protocol. Uh, and this fundamentally is, I don't want to say simple because actually it's, a bit involved, the idea is simple, but then you write a specification book that's actually over 1,000 pages long. But <laughs> the idea is very simple and very elegant. Uh, just that like, if you want to cover all the extreme cases, then you go into the extreme detail. But uh, this then TCP IP enables the internet like this, which is like amazing. In the same way, uh, Preamble Swap as a concept, as a mathematical model have uh, creates an opportunity for uh, new beautiful things that is in finance and shift us more closer to this beautiful vision of the finance where we maintain our custody of our assets, where we can easily express our trading desires, where we are not the product, but the consumer. We actually you know, like define what we want and we are direct participants in the world economy. Speaking speaking of consumers as the product, in the grand scheme of things, kind of on a philosophical level, not necessarily uh, a supply and demand level, but on a philosophical level, do you think the kind of 
productization of the consumer in terms of purchasing order flow that we see in something like a Robin Hood? Do you think it should exist? Because my, my feeling is still, even though it made a lot of big news, my feeling is still that most people I talk to who use Robin Hood, they don't, they don't understand what's actually going on. Do you think in the grand scheme of things, that's a net positive for a society that is necessarily going to engage in markets? Do you think it's a net positive or do you think it should exist at all? It's a huge negative because if Robin Hood would tell people that they are charging them some percentage of uh, the trades as a fees, uh, or if they would introduce some, you know, like subscription fee, then suddenly people would realize how much it costs and they would be able to better choose for themselves. But now, uh, if it's sent to some market making company and this market making company really knows how to make the market. And it can make most of this market internally such a way that it generates absolute returns uh, in the volatile market. That's our five, six times what the Robin Hood uh, is paid for that. Then, you know, you have to really question, like, you know, like uh, you can go into the Fiori space, you know, like who actually came up with the idea for Robin Hood? Because if I would be a big market making firm, I would just like start making the apps for the retail. Like it's such an amazing business, right? Um, and uh, this, like, I think like every, actually, I, I want to share the rule with people I absolutely use for most everything in my life. If something increases my freedom and or knowledge, I always go for that option. So mm. going for Robin Hood makes me dumber, right? Uh, they literally intentionally make me dumber. I don't want that. Uh, I prefer to go for something that's going to be slightly harder, but actually going to make me more intelligent and understand what's going on. And the same, actually, they remove the freedom because now uh, you are behind the wall, which is like the exchange, behind the wall, which is the dealer, behind the wall, which is the broker, behind the wall, which is the Robin Hood. And uh, this is, you know, like uh, removing the freedom you have in the market. And the crazy part is like when there was like this discussion when the Dogecoin was going crazy, uh, regardless like what we think about the Dogecoin, uh, there was a question if they have enough Dogecoin. The same for uh, the yeah. uh, GameStop. Uh, sorry, GameStop uh, stock. Um, it's, it's crazy that the trading app can prevent people from buying more of the stock and force them to sell. That's literally taking the definition of the freedom in trading away. And if everybody would be a rational trader, they would all stop using that app that day. I agree 100%. I had this conversation with, uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to buy, pre, try to pre bias your answer, but I feel exactly the same mm -hmm. way. I had this conversation with friends of mine mm -hmm. who basically, even though they know nothing about finance or economics generally, consider themselves to be sort of professional stay at home Robin Hood traders, <laughs> like at home on Robin Hood all day. And uh, I have this conversation with them all the time. And I honestly can't tell if they don't comprehend that they're the product of that app or if they just don't care. Either they absolutely don't care or they completely don't comprehend what's going on. But it, it blows my mind every time because they have no intention of. Uh, taking the advice, which I agree with 100%, everybody, if they're rational, they should stop using Robinhood. It doesn't make any sense at all. So given... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to uh, touch on that. Uh, there is such a beautiful truth behind that. Um, if you have the app, you know, like the Robinhood that um, treats you as a product, right? Then what are they taking away from you, right? And I would argue what they're actually trading away from you is uh, ability to say about yourself. And let me explain on that. Um, so I think a great example of that is technical analysis in finance. So as you call them Fibonacci, it's like 80% of technical analysis is pure bullshit. 20% of that kind of makes sense and can be used. Uh, but that's usually because it actually corresponds to the actual model that exists in finance. Uh, and this is same as uh, astrology, right? Uh, like some predictions of the future that don't make any sense, but they're kind of like called reading, so they make sense to us. Uh, what I want to say is like the world is 
full of beautiful curious people right but those people are usually at some starting stage of the journey so you know like they may be curious about the future they may be curious how to predict the stock market right and if they go and find the answer that's actually easy to them to comprehend right maybe they didn't study mathematics at the university right maybe they were never good at mathematics and they suddenly read a book about trading that's approachable right instead of telling them hey you have to write this complex stochastic formula that even university students may struggle with uh, and then this is just the starting point. Then people say like, wow, no way I'm going to understand. But somebody says, hey, you have this like wiggly triangle. Then the next triangle is goes there, another one goes there. And they're like, oh yeah, finally I'm learning something, right? But that's that illusion of learning because now the harder information to obtain, but really valuable information have been substituted with cheap misleading information. And I think that's the trick a lot of us for often in, and it's the same with uh, compared to astrology is the same because there are people who want to know what's going to happen tomorrow like people are naturally curious about the future right and instead yeah. of actually thinking more involving their mental cognition in that uh, they don't have time or they don't want to focus so much on that they go for the simpler option but usually the uh, simple option is a complete trap and falsehood and i think uh, those apps like Robin Hood are very similar in that sense because it's like, hey, I want to have more financial independence. I'm going to start trading. Hey, Robin Hood doesn't have any fees. I'm going to go there. Hey, I'm now a trader, right? Uh, and they make it also like they gamify. So like they enforce this thing of you being a good trader, right? So this is a trap, right? It's like some people fall into the astrology because they don't realize they're called reading and the bias has been confirmed there multiple times. Or people get into the technical analysis and they seen it working slightly better than a like flip of the coin, right? Especially on the historical data. Everything was on the historical data, right? Uh, yeah. and, and now they're convinced that they know something more. But it's not all traps, right? delusions, right? And uh, it's sad that the world is like built of this smoke banded mirrors, right? And often even seeking for the answer, we just find, you know, like a complete, uh, you know, uh, false, something that feels like describes reality, but it completely doesn't. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Um, just sort of, I, I feel like over the last couple of generations, like maybe maybe much younger people don't even realize what, what a revolution in information we've undergone in the last couple of generations. Because, and it makes me glad that crypto didn't somehow, wasn't somehow able to exist before this information revolution. But I try to describe to people because I sort of had that childhood that was analog. And then as, as I became a teenager, all of a sudden everything became digital. And I had this very, very digital adulthood, but I still had that analog childhood. I still remember it. And it's like, if, if crypto had been around then and we had the lack of availability of information, it would have been even so much worse. Like the predation on the average consumer would have been unbelievable because so much less information was available. I mean, literally people could come up with some obscure topic, tell you something about it. And it took so much more effort to confirm whether or not they're, they're correct. They could be like, yeah, turtles on the Galapagos weigh 10,000 pounds. And you'd be like, no, they don't. And they'd be like, oh yeah, how do you know? <laughs> You know, you're like, well, I guess I have to go to the library and find some encyclopedia with an entry on Galapagos turtles. If you're talking about, you know, blockchains that people are developing, you know, real time or projects, it would have been even more difficult. They, they'd be like, yeah, that project over on Ethereum has 10 million percent gains. And you'd be like, wow, I guess I better talk to somebody and find out if this is correct or not. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad we had sort of the, and of, of, of course, everything going on in the internet is sort of a prerequisite for everything we have going on in, in blockchain ecosystems and crypto. But it, it's hard to explain to younger people sometimes how much less information was available back in the day, which makes it even more amazing today that so much information is available. And yet we have these, they're not even asymmetries. Of, I mean, sometimes there are true asymmetries of information still, but there are also just a lot of asymmetries of comprehension where people, it's like an asymmetry of labor. People aren't willing to do the labor to figure out that they're, you know, they're the product of X, you know, financial or other platform they're using. And they don't care because the effort to acquire that comprehension is greater than, you know, is, uh, is, is too great. It's too much of a detriment given the benefit they get, you know, whatever benefit they get from being the product of that, uh, of that, uh, that platform. It's, it's kind of an amazing time when there's so much information available and yet so many people just sort of want to 
do as little of that discovery of information, as little of that due diligence is necessary so they can continue using the products they seem to love to use. So given, given all this that's going on, where do you think all of this crypto movement, all this stuff, where is it going? In your true heart of hearts, do you think crypto will have taken over by choose any day in the future, 2035? Are we going to get to that place where crypto has taken over or are we all just deluding ourselves? 100% crypto is going to take over. Uh, I just think it's going to be called the digital market or digital assets. And hopefully we won't be forced to use the CDBCs in that. And I tell you how I know that. Uh, I have a lot of people in my network that really shape some specific sector of financial market. And I've been shocked how many of them have been going and opening new companies, you know, like opening new legislation fronts, etc., all related to digitization of the assets and digital trading. And this is mind blowing. And another crazy thing is that like I'm coming across a lot of interesting projects, especially you know, like when studying uh, zero knowledge proofs area and looking who else is developing there. There's a lot of interesting projects that are really trying to do revolutionary stuff and they are completely flying under the radar, right? So, you know, Shiba Inu, everybody knows about that. But the next approach to actually hosting the websites in a completely centralized manner that's also quite fast and responsive is completely on the people ready, but actually companies trying to build that in a very sensible way and, you know, we have a lot of ways that were completely unsensible, right? And they're getting to some use cases that actually start to make sense. Uh, for instance, like internet computer protocol, like this was like a joke, right? I don't even want to get into that, but uh, right, you right. always have something to suck 95% of the oxygen or the 5% oxygen thing to materialize. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be crazy. I, I, it's always hard to put a date on that, but I think it's going to be much sooner than we expect. And I think it's like also another interesting observation that I have uh, from like predicting the market and such. So usually people expect something is going to happen next year, right? And yeah. they almost always disappoint. Oh, wow, it doesn't happen. I'm so disappointed, right? But then the next prediction, something is going to happen in the next five, 10 years and it happens in the next two, three years. So I think uh, crazily enough, right? Actually, you were asking me about the next five years. Actually, I think it may happen already in the next five years. Uh, if mm. the internet revolution taught us a thing, it was how crazy the acceleration of the progress in uh, technology is. And I think it's completely feasible that we will be there in five years. Uh, I just think that 95% of the crypto that exists today, especially with three fiats in the top that are backed by nothing or backed by the empty promises, and the blockchains that are backed by completely broken technology, and then the blockchains that are stores of value that are really good at hitting the planet, uh, and nothing else that they have people turning, you know, like the dollar bills to show off, right? Because they got into the Bitcoin server that they have too much dollar bills, apparently. Uh, I think all this stuff is going to be gone. Bitcoin, yeah, beautiful idea, right? A lot of beautiful ideas along the way, but the nature of things is that the uh, worst innovations are replaced with the better innovations. It usually takes time, but everybody hires milkshake for something. It's like a very nice analogy of this milkshake was, I forgot like what food um, uh, fast food chain in the US did this study, but it's a very famous study that they wanted to find what consistency milkshake should have. And the natural thing was to make the survey get the average, right? But they actually hired smart people for that. And what they found out that in the morning, the people who are driving to work are replacing the milkshake with the breakfast. So they want to really um, dense milkshake that they can dry, uh, drink very slowly over the entire route to work. And when they're going there in the afternoon and the evening, they usually bring the kids. So they don't want the kid to drink it so slowly. So they want more loose milkshake so it can be drink fast. And then uh, you go and work with completely different answers. So you have mm. to answer the question, why did you hire this milkshake? And people are always going to answer this question. So like, as soon as the blockchains find the utility in their world, then it suddenly is going to become, okay, I'm picking this one because this one solves my problem better. Mm. 
Interesting. I, I, yeah, I, I, it seems like it's, um, it's really observable in, uh, in the crypto space, this, uh, this idea that people, humans tend to overestimate technical technological progress in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. It seems like that's really, really observable in crypto. I remember, man, back in, back in 2013, we, you know, we had, we had Bitcoin and there were a few, a few coins that weren't quite yet called altcoins, but they weren't Bitcoin. We had Litecoin and a few things around and people were talking about programmability. There was colored coins going on, things like that. Ethereum hadn't had, hadn't quite ICO'd yet. And I like, I think people thought the adopt at that time myself for sure. And I think most people I talked to felt like the adoption of Bitcoin was going to happen so much faster over the next, you know, three years, five years, much faster than it actually happened. And we also would have vastly underestimated the impact that programmability would have on blockchains. Like what, what the programmability we would see with Ethereum, we ve probably vastly underestimated where we would be in 2022. So I think that's definitely, that's definitely observable in, uh, in Bitcoin. What else, what would you say about the culture? We've already talked about how Cardano is a little bit People are maybe a little more academic. The Cardano community is a little bit more academic. What else would you say sort of about, about the Cardano community versus the rest of crypto besides just being a little bit more, we'll call it academic. What would you say about Cardano? What do you observe about Cardano versus the rest of the crypto space? Too nice. Uh, guys, you have the right, <laughs> the, the right to be upset about things, right? It's like you don't have to... Uh, be nice to everyone and make peace with everyone. Uh, having the opinion or some opinion kind of implies an argument and the argument doesn't have to be a negative thing. You just like an exchange of the opinion where you try to convince other party to what you think. But if you think you are right, you should be standing your ground, not being you know, like trying to be polite to everyone. Polite, being polite is nice. But being polite only works with the nice people and not everybody is nice in the world. So I definitely think uh, the Cardano community needs to be a bit more like a bullish dumpling, uh, you know, spicy. Um, and I think it's extremely healthy. Also, what I think the Cardano community has to start thinking more on its own. Uh, so big figures, and not only I'm talking about just like just big figures in general, uh, are and by the way that's so impressive what you have done because you completely removed yourself from this thing because like you technically are in a very like a uh, unique position like people really respect you for what you bring but you removed your person from that right uh but uh the thank you uh, i really respect that appreciate that and <laughs> there is like a lot of figures in the space uh that are not shouldn't be carrots on everything they bring some good message about something but we have to be more independent and more uh self-thinking so not everything that charles says is okay some stuff that he says is brilliant i actually like a lot of stuff that he's saying i am learning from that too but same you know not everything that io is going to say is good right well some things that a Murgo may say may be good as well, right? Uh, it's safe for mm -hmm. the Cardano Foundation. But basically what we need is uh, not just decentralization of the blockchain, we need decentralization of how this blockchain exists. And uh, we cannot also live in the bubble thinking that Cardano is perfect. No, far from it. There are some really big holes in Cardano. And I don't mean security holes. It's basically things that we should be addressing. Uh, as the community and uh, the thing to go there is actually to do like the people in the science do all the time right they argue with each other right I, I think this should be that because blah 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 right and now if somebody wants to pick that argument what they should do is say hey I agree with you because I was thinking and also I see that that, that. or hey I don't agree with you because what about that what about that or I see like this problem with your argument and this way we get somewhere and also uh, 
I kind of disagree with Charles that there is special communication channel for some specific topics. No, any communication channel is good as long as it leads to constructive communication. So the really only thing that we need is a culture of the conversation, but that's something that's also evolving, like the ecosystem, right? We are building the norms, they don't exist yet. We are establishing them by experimentation, or maybe we do something X way. But we found that the result is good, so we like it. So we start using it more. And actually, I've seen uh, some spaces often like emerge to talk about the topic. It's like very healthy, right? It's kind of like bringing people together. Let's chat together. Somebody wants to join, they join. If somebody doesn't have time, they stay out, right? It's the cost of staying out that you don't have to voice. You don't voice your opinion, right? Uh, but you know, uh, we are still early. But uh, you know, it's always good to be free independent so freedom also in place the freedom of thought so don't be afraid to express your own but also the freedom comes with the challenge right so other people are going to challenge what you're saying so be ready that be open uh okay you don't agree with me why right and then you learn something and the crazy thing is like uh not everyone has to teach everybody everything else like it's like a large community, right? So if you are very vocal talking to each other, it's literally the huge, like the humming, decentralized network. But, you know, um, the really scary thing is how much blockchain is similar to social media in a sense that you have this nodes of popularity. And that's like, by the way, how the social networks exist, you know, like this whole area in computer science that actually studies the graph structure of the social networks. And then you have this mega clusters that cluster out some specific celebrities. Uh, and I think that's the property that's damaging the freedom or decentralization to the blockchain. I mean, like the thought decentralization, because everybody should be forming their own opinion. So it's not like, oh, okay, somebody said that, so I'm going to quote them. No. Somebody said that, so I have now to internalize this information, put it through my own filter, see if it makes sense, right? So I'm building my own model of this understanding. Of course, I'm getting information from these people is completely fine, but I have to internalize it. Uh, and yeah, uh, and by the way, this is how I believe we build this amazing group of people that is going to question CTBC sets and it's already is doing that, right? But uh, we can still be better at that. Yeah, that's it's it's interesting. I I definitely I've been um very surprised, very surprised, especially over the last couple of years. Um, and probably this probably occurs. It does occur in crypto in general. Um, but even in Cardano, because I always I always think about crypto as still being aligned with some of these radical ideas um, about not relying on fiat currency and central banks and having this completely separate thing, completely independent thing going on. I'm trying to use very non-political terminology to describe this, but this completely independent thing going on from what the mainstream is a part of. So I think of everybody in crypto, I automatically, my default is to think of everyone in crypto sort of having that same mentality. But over the last couple of years, I've seen this extreme aversion to any type of conflict, any type of verbal conflict. It's like, it's like you're standing there and you look at this herd and one member of the herd pops their head out and they're like, yo, bro, uh, maybe <laughs> you don't know about the consensus mandate of the herd, but you're definitely outside it. You need to get over here as fast as you can. <laughs> and you're like, no, I'm, I'm really trying to think for myself here. I, I see this even on my channel. If I say something that's not quite within the herd mandate, I'll actually get people sending me private messages and they're like, I really don't think you should say that about that project or about that person or disagree with that. And I'm like, okay, that's, it's interesting you say that. Why, why do you say that? And the answer always basically boils down to that's outside of the, the consensus herd mandate. And I'm like, that's, that's what's required for progress and innovation. The only innovative thinking has to almost by definition be outside of the herd consensus mandate. If everybody stays within the consensus mandate, you get zero innovation. Like, you want as many people outside that as possible. Like sometimes they're going to be wrong, but the only way you get the innovation is if some people are willing to be wrong and right and you eventually absorb the right ideas. But if we go with this consensus mandate thing, we'll become static. Like we won't, there won't be any dynamic progress. We'll just be frozen in time here forever, which some blockchains, they've already hit that. Some blockchains, they decided, hey, we're good. We're good. We have a ledger, we can store value. 
we're not going to do the money thing anymore. No more, no more transactions for, for goods or anything like that. We're just going to store value. We're good. Let's stay here forever. And I don't think, I think everybody in, in Cardano doesn't want that to be the case, but I think there's been this disturbing trend towards consensus mandate and people very afraid to go outside of it. So I hope, I hope people take what you said to heart and they be, become less afraid to be outside of the herd thinking, you know, and less afraid to be the only one saying X, Sometimes you might be right, sometimes you might be wrong, but that's the price we pay for innovation in my mind. And that's a very scary thing, especially on the social media, to say something that people won't disagree with. Um, and uh, this is scary for one reason, right? Like now uh, you may be a small Twitter account, for instance, right, with 100 followers, and you say something controversial, and then a Twitter account with 100,000 followers comes and replies to you, and what Twitter does, that's extremely ugly, in my opinion, is they post that tweet on that person with a lot of followers timeline. So now you get like five likes, maybe even if majority of people would technically agree with you, but that other person gets you know, 500 likes. So what you think now is, hey, like I've been so, just socially humiliated. Like they showed me how wrong I am, right? That's just... This is a symbol of heart for that, right? But it's literally then, you know, that mental torture, right? And I don't know if a lot of people can sustain that because a lot of people don't like to be so confrontational. So it's a crazy thing. I just wanted to leave people with one thought, uh, which I find to find the interesting. Cucumber has more DNA in it than a human being, right? So how much is the human being able to do so many things, right? High evolution, right? We have this like random mutations in the body, right? That changes functionality slightly. And that's exactly what you say. We have to be evolving, right? So we have to enable this mutation. So, hey, somebody may be wrong, but because five people were wrong, the sixth person can be extremely right. And this way we actually learn something that makes everything better or somebody else is getting this person's idea and hey actually i can make it into something even better right that's how i always said like that's how you make all the synapses in the brain that's like the centralized brain the entire you know like community of kind of like start sparking with information and ideas yeah it's man it, yeah super super interesting ideas um it's uh i i agree it is kind of this uh this aversion the aversion to conflict thing is is i in my mind, I, I definitely ascribe this to the rise of social media. It, it's so brutal. We see it all the time in crypto Twitter. You got ratioed. Look at the, look at how hard this guy got ratioed. And it's like they're punishing people for having an opinion that's contrary to a much bigger follower. And it's of course, it's always interpreted as the quality of this much larger accounts idea was better. That's why they got 10x the, the likes. It's certainly not because they have one 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 thousand times as many followers so they're gonna get more likes whether they're right or wrong but uh yeah i i always wonder how how um how different generationally we're going to be given that we've got we've got kids now growing up in a society that's that's where they've always been exposed to social media there was no such thing as pre-social media to them and now i mean a kid born today they're going to be born in an age where people have always been getting ratioed I mean, how much how much social suicide would it have been in your Oklahoma high school if uh, you were getting ratioed every other day by like the hottest hottest girl in the high school or something when she comes along and she's like, actually, I think you know whatever what have you just posted sucks, and then everyone in the high school is like, she's right. I mean, it's so so brutal. I wonder what effect that has on society. Uh, hundred percent. I can actually, I think, kind of tell you, uh, I've. I actually venture in very surprising uh, streams. So I don't have kids, right? But uh, I've stumbled upon uh, the channel about uh, neuroscience and the kid development. And part of this discourse was how the merging effect giving kids tablet has on the brain and i listened to it because like oh it's about brain so like it's very interesting like everything about the brain is automatically interesting to me uh and what i found surprising is because you know like uh, parents themselves have a short attention span a lot of them give their kids tablets i now watch peppa the peak or whatever but now the kids uh start to become disconnected to the real world and that's the very important connection that develops the brain like the most of the brains actually is to deal with the motion 
right? And if you don't develop the connection, it was like your brain literally doesn't develop correctly. So now we have all these kids with uh, dyslexia, this autographia, with a lot of other issues, ADHD. All those issues, uh, sorry, not maybe all, like, but a lot of those issues can be traced exactly to that, like to this early stage brain not being developed correctly. And now when you think of that, uh, there's also this natural mechanism in people to conforming. And this mechanism is already really strongly enforced by the way schools operate. I don't know how many people know that, but most of the schools up to the university level have been based on the Prussian model. And Prussian model was basically based on a simple thing, how to make a very conformist society where you can have people performing simple jobs without complaining because they wanted to industrialize entire Prussia and militarize it. Uh, and literally that system of education was created specifically to aim in that. And if you ever has been in school and you are disobedient kid, right? Like you are questioning the authority, you have your own ideas. That's why you pushed so back down. So we already conditioned to be conformist. But now when I think of like exactly what you said, now these kids, like literally, they only leave, uh, leave uh, for... Um, for being accepted by this huge internet network, then literally we're going to have one big brainless dead brain. So instead of sparking brain, we're going to have the brain that's afraid to do anything because everything can be questioned. Yeah, like a giant, giant social media enforced hive mind almost. It's super, super interesting to me. I'm, 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 I don't want to say I'm not excited, but I'm anxious to see how this whole social media thing turns out once we have people who are like, you know, 40, 50 years old, and they've lived in this, in this society where you had this, this pressure from the social media hive mind your entire life. You never experienced life before that. It's going to be interesting. I think it's definitely some kind of a change. Speaking, speaking of these kinds of things and conformity, non-conformity, um, I'm not assuming you have time to actually consume any kind of media, including podcasts, but are there any, are there any non-crypto podcasts or things like that that you consume? Oh, uh, so you're right saying I don't have time for that. And uh, I tell you one thing. So uh, I consume my information slightly differently than most of the people because I think I know like a lot of people are, you know, like podcasts on the go, you know, like a YouTube channel on the go, everything in the background. Uh, I, I I know it's going to sound weird, right? But I'm going to, I'm always trying to make a special time for the thing I'm doing. And I'm always thinking what exactly I want to do. So for example, like I'm picking a specific book to read or I'm picking you know, like a specific research paper to read uh, or a specific mental exercise to do. And then I focus only on that. And I found this over the span of many years because I started doing that at the university was extremely helpful. And that actually, frankly, also it's something that I first time heard from Phil Wadler in the lecture, he said, he was talking about student performance, right? So how I, I run it, right? But actually the, the thought stuck with me, which was if you do every day 10% than other st students, this is going to compound over the years to such level that you won't be able to believe. And this stuck with me. So, you know, like I, I was like already like, I, I want to read everything, right? I want to learn everything. Uh, but, you know, like uh, I started, you know, like doing it even more uh as a sacrament, you know, like I'm focusing this time specifically to learning something new. Um, and I found it had an amazing impact on me because uh, then when I thought consciously about what I'm reserving this time for, it's no longer like a background noise. And by the way, there's a lot of good background noise. It's like Planet Money, for instance, just like, uh, popped to my mind. I listened some time ago, like actually they have a lot of good podcasts that are short. Um, but uh, then, you know, it's like completely different, right? And uh, even when I listen to the audiobooks, I tend to try to pick the books I would read otherwise. But now instead I listen to them. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I have to say, you know, like, uh, it's also like another concept, you know, it's like um, think slow, think fast. So it's like basically if you think about something, so like consume something slowly, then you actually are then able to use it in a very fast way, right? And yep, uh, yep. They, it's a very important part of internalizing that. Uh, so as much as I can, I try to do that. And the crazy thing is 
after what I describe, you can think, oh yeah, okay, so he has this figure out. No, I struggle with this all the time too. So you know, for instance, you know, like you have YouTube, you open it, you have timeline in it, right? And everything that you do tries to distract you. Hey, you know, here I am. I look very interesting. Click on me, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is uh, something you have to restrain from. And actually, I have the trick. Uh, I don't think it's official call that I'm calling it edging, so like very sexually context, right? But <laughs> I have this uh, idea that now I have this edge, but this edge is going to pass in time. And just only by saying it aloud that I realize it's going to pass, right? I'm able to completely forget also like, okay, I, I want to do that. Oh, I'm going to, uh, but just saying, okay, this is just, you know, like an edge is going to pass. It actually passes. It helps me. So, so you, so you actually action. verbalize it. Like in, in the context of this example, you're going through YouTube and they've got all the crazy thumbnails, like the shocked expression, even though it's obviously going to be something that's not shocking at all. Mm -hmm. So you actually verbalize, oh, I have an urge to click on that because that person is, has a compelling thumbnail in some way. You actually verbalize it though as you go past it. It helps yes. you pass the urge. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So when you okay. So when you do, I agree in the in the sense that um multitasking is probably vastly overrated, and like sort of unitasking is probably vastly underrated. I, I agree with that very strongly. I'm like a terrible multitasker. Anytime I've ever tried to. Um, absorb anything in the background, even though it's quite pleasurable to do that. It's like I absorb so much less, so much less than I would if I was actually focused on it. So when you are focused on something, say an audiobook, when it's not something to do with sort of your professional life, uh, again, not assuming you actually have time for this sort of thing, but if you did, what kinds of audiobooks would you would you consume? <laughs> Uh, so now, unfortunately, I don't have time, but I can tell you what I uh, was doing when I had some time and what I'm going to be doing when I have more time. So the first thing on my list is watching Edge Runners uh, on Netflix. I'm a huge uh, fan of cyberpunk, and I know are, are, everybody... I've, I've seen it. Are, are you are you prepared for it? Are you prepared for what's gonna happen? What what happens in this show? <laughs> What happens to the show? <laughs> no, I'm not. I won't <laughs> give you any spoilers. I don't, okay. don't, don't watch. There's so much content about... I unfortunately consumed a tiny bit of the content. I, I did not verbalize my urge and bypass it. Before I watched it, I consumed a tiny bit of the content about... You know, I, I didn't realize at the time, but it was from people who'd already watched Edge Runners. I, too, am a giant fan of cyberpunk I, I love the game i've played the game way too much have you put you've played the game i assume right yes uh, i've played the game i really enjoy it frankly no positive to so many you know like reviews uh but i have to tell you a crazy thing i don't know if you heard about that but cyberpunk 2077 is actually based on an rpg game called uh, cyberpunk red and cyberpunk 2020 and i actually used to play this as a game top and uh like I've been like in this whole cyberpunk theme so much. So for me, like when the game was like was already like the dream dream coming true, right? And now oh, I know God. this amazing anime series is out, right? Uh, it, this is really hard edging, I have to tell you. Oh man! Oh, I, so okay. I didn't know anything about the tabletop RPG game until I until I played the actual game. As soon as I saw not even a video trailer for the game, but as soon as I saw the first still image of the game, I don't know why it was so compelling. But I saw that first still image of sort of the the main character, and I was like, oh. Oh, I'm gonna love this game. I don't <laughs> completely understand why, but I'm gonna love it. So as soon as I saw that image, I started, you know, reading everything about the upcoming release, and I discovered there was this tabletop game I never, I'd never heard of. I can't imagine how much, how pleasurable that experience must have been if you played the tabletop game and then you played the actual video game. Okay, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but how many hours do you think you put into the video game? I think 50. Uh, so, okay, that's uh, as busy as you are. That's pretty good. That's a lot. So long time ago. So okay, you <laughs> haven't you haven't watched Edge Runners yet, though. No, uh, I can't wait. But probably I will do it uh, as a part of the reward after we release the protocol. If anybody's seen it in the comments, don't look at the comments because I'm sure somebody there's 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 there are spoilers they could give you that would <laughs> be very detrimental. Actually, that's a crazy thing of me. I'm completely immune to spoilers. And I know okay. it's surprising. Actually, spoilers make something 
usually even more enjoyable for me to watch. Uh, so I'm kind of like contrarian on that. I go back and I go back and forth. I, ha I had a friend uh, a couple of decades ago. I had a friend who was the biggest cinema fan ever. Just truly loved anything having to do with the cinema, and they absolutely refused to watch any trailer, read any article, any preview. They would consume absolutely nothing about any movie they were seriously interested in. And I go back and forth. Sometimes when I'm really excited about something like the cyberpunk release, I was super excited. I Sometimes I'll consume nothing and just allow myself to be astonished because I am discovering everything for the very first time. And then sometimes like with cyberpunk, I read everything. I read everything about it before it came out. So I go back and forth. I I find value in both both approaches, but I can understand. I can understand uh, what I you're saying. I tell you why I don't mind spoilers uh, because I'm so innately curious that not knowing something actually causes me mental pain. So the fact mm. that I know a bit more of it removes some of this pain. So actually, I really don't mind spoilers. Mm, interesting. Sometimes. So I experienced this with edge runners because I, I, I definitely, I definitely read about the biggest spoiler you could possibly, you could possibly have for that series. And I still enjoyed it so much. Um, I, I think, uh, my significant other thinks I'm insane. Cause I don't normally, um, I haven't, that that person knows of, <laughs> I haven't, uh, she does, that person does not know of me consuming any kind of animated anything. So they were very, uh, very surprised when I was like constantly watching edge runners. I think there's, uh, what, what, there are like 10 episodes, I think, but pretty, pretty engaging, especially if you play the game. It's very, man, the dovetailing with the game is very, very satisfying if you played the game. So, okay. I didn't expect you to say that edge runners. Nice, Absolutely. Okay. I'm so looking forward to that. Uh, also, I'm a huge fan of Terry Pratchett books. They are just so perversely uh, unexpected. I absolutely love things that are unexpected. And in his books, literally everything is on his head. Uh, I think I've read almost all of them. There's like quite a few of them. Oh, I only don't know because Terry Pratchett. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't read any of the books, but okay. In interesting. Okay. Are these uh, so tell tell us about these tell us about these books. What what are the what what types of what types of books are these? Uh, so uh, it's most like Terry Pratchett wrote like different books, but the, his most known series about the Discord. So that's basically the world in the shape of pizza placed on the top of four elephants placed on the top of a turtle that's swimming through the space and oh, uh, turtles turtles all the way down. Kind of, okay. Yes, but the books itself like are about the different uh, citizens of the Discord, and uh, you know, for instance, you have the magician who cannot learn any spells, right? But he has still like all these interesting adventures, uh, and uh, you know, like it's just literally so unexpected. You know, like um, how how to say? You no, know, it's like uh, for instance, um, you have a story of uh, the god. But the guys, you know, it's like getting the power from the number of the followers, right? So it's like really small, like almost disappeared gods. So he tries to regain his followers and he goes on this like long quest, you know, like to try uh, to get there. And you could see it like be completely perverse. You know, it's like uh, life is sometimes like a perfect satire, right? And it's like it's always like written such like a perfect satire. You know, it's like almost life is trying to make a joke of your end. But in this case of those books, I, the, you know, the uh a character describing the book and uh, it's just so entertaining i absolutely love it interesting okay interesting all right what else what else would you like to tell everyone everyone listening out there either about either about crypto in general or is there anything else surprising that people would be very surprised to learn about you oh uh great question uh I don't. Know. Uh, probably not. Uh, I'm, you know, like uh, as you as you see me. That's uh, as you get me, right? Actually, sorry. Uh, you you might be surprised by one thing, but you've seen it already. The pit vipers. <laughs> I was I was very surprised when I saw the pit vipers. I I was actually very surprised. Oh, we did have a question. Uh, even before even before we went we went live, someone was very concerned about the length of your hair. I, I actually used the picture of you with the pit vipers, and someone was very concerned. They were like, 
Wait a second. It looks like the hair is shorter. What percentage of the hair we lost here has been cut? Like, what percentage has been cut? I think they'll be very satisfied to find out. I'm, I'm thinking this is 0% cutting in, in actuality here, right? So I'm going actually to let everybody watching on a secret that I don't think I've told anyone yet. Maybe, you know, like some people very close to me, right? But I'm not going to cut my hair until the protocol is released. Uh, so no, there was no centimeters of hair lost. Oh, uh, okay. So the hair is just going to run. The hair is going to run That's wild it. until the protocol is released. And what is, is there anything, uh, again, you don't have to answer this question if it's, um, if there's no way to give a satisfactory answer to this, but what can you tell people about timeline for the protocol? Uh -huh. uh, so I can actually tell a lot, but probably not the simple answer that people want. So when, okay. when it's ready, right? Uh, okay. You don't want half baked pizza, right? Uh, even if it's with pineapple. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, like uh, I want to describe it by analogy. So the central system has it easier because you have, you know, like they've, uh, wireless, the network inside is fragmented. So for somebody to be able to mess with the system, they have to be able to hack inside the system first on the blockchain when everything is decentralized. They are already in the bank with access to all the buttons, right? So you want to make sure the buttons work as expected. But even despite having the access to the counter, uh, to everything else, that they still cannot mess the system. So this is a huge responsibility uh, to think of all those cases. But also we are building something highly complex. So I can let you on the information at the stage we are. So we have uh, multiple private testants working from the front end UI uh, through the entire pipeline, but we are still iterating on that. So we haven't done the audit of the core system yet. So this is yet to happen and this is quite complex system. So typical audit takes one month. I think I may take you know, two, three. And that's going to be also around the time you're going to release the public testnet. And only after all those things passes, then it's going to be mainnet release. Uh, so there is still quite some time. Uh, it's not like crazy amount of time. You know, it's like we are much closer than the further. But uh, this is also part of uh, software engineering. As much as it's, you know, like hard science, you know, I'm going to exactly describe what you're doing. It's also an art because you are finding a lot of things along the way. And the closer you converge on the actual product, the more you know, like you see the things that still uh, require more testing, uh, more development, and everything along the side. And also, we take a lot of these things like very seriously. So you know, like uh, not just public testnet, uh, the audit, but also like red teaming, right? Like we want to try to hack the protocol ourselves. We want to hire people to actually try to hack it. Uh, and then, you know, like part of the public testnet also release a bounty for uh, reporting the bugs of different vulnerability. And then there's also blue teaming, right? So then uh, you assume the role, okay, so what somebody can do to potentially exploit the system. So you look from the different perspective. It's a lot of uh, mental and practical exercises that you do that you impress the belief in the system. And also, despite there not being tools for uh, state modeling of the code on Cardano, uh, the static and dynamic analysis, you can replicate a lot of the approaches. So uh, if the time allows, I hope it does. And we're already thinking about that is to write uh, some code for analyzing the code. So it allows you to further increase uh, that certainty. And I want maybe to explain to people, because you know, like, uh, you know, for that, I'm sure some people in Dallas know, but I'm sure like a lot of people actually are not aware what the audit is at the moment. At the moment, what audit on Cardano is, you give other Haskell people the code to be read. That's it. They just read your code. And hopefully they have the fresh perspective because they haven't written the code, which is actually a very good thing often. And the second one, they spent time to develop this uh, auditing mindset uh, that they can spot the vulnerabilities, right? And just like ongoing process. So this usually helps, but this is not like, I don't know, X-raying it to the last bit. No, it's code review. And that's something that the code out it shouldn't be because that actually should be much more than that. So I want to give an example from traditional software engineering, GitHub has the programming language called CodeQL. 
whenever a new code vulnerability is discovered, it's being written this code QL language. So now in any programming language, I write the same pattern of vulnerability. If I use different variables, I write different way, it's going to be detected in scanning. And that's one of the things that should be done for something so important as crypto, right? We would want to scan Pluto score code and find known vulnerabilities, right? And this should be like a core part of the audit. Another one, as I mentioned, static analysis, what it is. You generate the control flow graph of the program. So all the states your program can end up with, and you analyze if it reaches any of the states that shouldn't be reachable. And then you can do the state modeling. So you expand all the possible states. And this sometimes is sometimes very expensive because there's usually a lot of different states. But then you check each state after state if it should be reachable or not. And then you dynamic analysis. So it's like very much like the static one, but you actually run the code. And during the running, you check if there is something unexpected going on. And those are just like the typical tools that you employ to actually uh, do a proper audit of the code. They doesn't exist yet, right? So one, of course, they're amazing auditors with a lot of knowledge that you absolutely should use. But also if you are really serious about the audit, you should do something more than that. That makes sense. Yeah, especially the state modeling. It, it makes sense when when uh, we think about it in the abstract, if, if you're trying to, if your ultimate goal is to avoid those states where you have an exploit, then you should probably be modeling out all the states or as many as you possibly can. And if you're not doing that, if you're just having the auditor go through and read the code and they're not actually modeling out all the states, how can you have any assurance really at all that you're not going to achieve one of those states that amounts to an exploit? Exactly. Not to point fingers, there was already an auditor who did the code outed, but there turned out to be the serious vulnerability in the code. And it's not to blame the auditor, it's just uh, that's the form of the audit that exists now on Cardano. It's yep. much better than nothing, but that's still a long way to go. Yep, I'm probably I'm probably thinking of the same example that you're citing. Um, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, I, ho I hope we get there. I hope we get to some heightened heightened level of uh, audit culture where those things are required. But okay, mm -hmm. so that's so that's that's a good that's a pretty good indication as to uh, timeline. Where where is the best where's the best place for people to find you? Find Axo. Where should people go? Uh, thank you for asking that. So at Axo Trade on Twitter, the best place, even better place than the best place is Discord. Uh, so uh, if you want to talk with a lot of amazing people uh, from the community, join the Discord. Uh, and uh, that's it. And if for some reason uh, you're one of those people who need an idol, then I'm on Twitter as well. <laughs> uh, but uh, I want to, I will make it slightly more complicated for you have to find what the tag is right, uh, right. So if you want to <laughs> there you go I, th I think I think people can do some searching they can do some searching and they'll be able to find you is there anything else so we've been on for two hours and 17 minutes thank you so much for coming on I know I keep saying it but I can't imagine how busy you guys are so I really appreciate you taking on this time to uh, to jump jump on this jump on this uh, podcast is there anything else you want to say to people uh, one thing, but I will say it after the first thing I want to say. So uh, it's really honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It was extremely nice speaking with you uh, and great questions. I really enjoyed uh, the full span of it. And now the message to all the people uh, still here, you know, it's like Procon Cardano. Uh, <laughs> we are here to change the future. One good time. That is absolutely perfect. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Thank Yark. You.